Um, so I think I will kind of like use this as an experimental stage to propose some of uh, the new ideas and uh, the kind of work that I've been working on. Uh, as you look at the title, it's called Public Interest Enterprise, uh, in which I was trying to uh, look at whether we can bring in government into the discourse in social entrepreneurship uh, theory and practice. And th this is actually based on a long uh, sort of understanding that when we talk about social entrepreneurship and social enterprise, the government is always not there, at least in the major publications, right? So we always look at social enterprise as a standalone activity that is not um, sort of connected to the government. In fact, they're trying to stay away from the government because they, they want to have their own freedom to do a lot of things. But if you look at social enterprises and social entrepreneurs as problem solvers, basically they themselves are facing a lot of problems and we all know that, right? And I'm not talking about problems at a very practical level, but at least at the discourse level, in the research level of how we see these things. One of these problems is an, uh, an exaggeration of what agency means uh, for social entrepreneurship. We, we tend to think of social enterprise as a, you know, a very powerful, omnipotent in its ability to solve a lot of uh, societal problems. We, we have this uh, different kind of fellowships, Ashoka, Skoll, Swap, Echo and Green. And th that is actually one problem. And also social entrepreneurship, although it has been casted as a problem solving mechanism, it is also a source of problems. And some of the scholars have been talking about this in some major journals. The second point is um, systemic change has been discussed as the holy grail of what social enterprises and social entrepreneurs want to achieve. But the question is, we often neglect the role of government in that space. We do know government is very powerful, uh, has a lot of resources, have a lot of influence to make things. So what governments do or don't do can influence a lot of things uh, in tackling societal challenges and grand challenges. And we also know that a lot of social enterprises, although it has been around for what thirty years, forty years, at least in the you know in the in the, in the literature, but it has much longer history. But most of the social enterprises are small and weak. We haven't seen social enterprises that are unicorns or publicly listed in the stock market. So um, this leads to the other issues about the question of what is what is meant by social. There's a lot of research. And the focus on social entrepreneurship is on work integration social enterprise or WISE, right? So these are the kind of social rights that try to create jobs for maybe disabled people, elderly, you know, new migrants, disadvantaged groups of people. But the question is, what exactly that we want to benefit from? Who do we want to benefit to when we talk about social enterprise? Are we just going to benefit a niche groups of people, which is what a lot of WISE are doing? or doing to see social enterprises to benefit the public or doing something in the interest of the public to create benefits for the public. And the last but not least, and I'll, I'll go through, through this in, in other episodes of my talk, is there is a strong domination of Western theories and perspectives in terms of how to fix societal problems. And I, I do know because, you know, this is great opportunity because all the speakers today are from the global South. Um, for example, one of the way that social entrepreneurs work is to use market mechanisms to solve social problems. But in our own research, for example, we look at the Philippines, uh, some of these market mechanisms is actually causing a lot of fracture in the social fabric in some of the places that social enterprise were operating. Uh, it ignores local culture and local customs. Next. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are the basically the, the main issues that I've been talking about. So. How do we solve this question about agency and its relationship with the government? What can um, the government do? What role the, does the government can play with regard to social enterprises, right? And when we talk about the government, there's a whole stream of literature in public administration and public management that is often not integrated with social entrepreneurship. So, you know, these things are just kind of like very much separated. So social entrepreneurship 
or social enterprises can benefit from understanding what its relationship with government or policy makers are and knowing how they can position themselves in relation to the government or policy makers. So this is the kind of major point that I want to, to raise today. Next. So I'm going to look at three cases that have been very successful in terms of creating public interest. They started as a social enterprise and they've been changing a lot in various aspects of the government or policy makers. Let's go to the first case. So, so this has been partly published and some of them are in the process of being published. Uh, so please bear with me um, uh, as, as the, the data, the information uh, can be further enhanced. The first is um, a social enterprise that works in the housing sector in Hong Kong. So they started uh, many years ago, uh, starting with just a couple of empty apartments uh, in which the owner are willing to rent it to the social enterprise. And the social enterprise will work together with single parents and put two or more single parents to live together in these very nice apartments, right? And you all know that Hong Kong has been experiencing a uh, housing shortage. So what they do is, um, because of the model that they're using, very innovative and working really well, they were mentioned in a policy budget some years ago. And then they were mentioned again in a policy address in 2017. And later they uh, inspired the Hong Kong government to form a new policy called the transitional housing policy. Next. So if you can see what happens to light B, they started with a small prototype of a social enterprise and they gained policy attention, which means that they gained the government's attention that this could be a new solution to the housing problems in Hong Kong. And the, the green one at the bottom there is a scale up version of the original prototype. And later, they, uh, the, the, the government was experimenting with this new type of solution that Lightbe was proposing. And this is one of the first housing that they're providing called the, called the T-Home. And later, they, this model is adopted by the Hong Kong government. And now in various stages from in progress, in planning and being completed, there's gonna be 21,000 units of flats with over 11 billion Hong Kong dollars in the project. So it becomes a policy mix of the government to provide housing solution. Next. Uh, Diamond Cap. This is also another social enterprise that I've been working with uh, for a long time in terms of doing research together with them and inviting them to various talks. So this Diamond Cap, uh, they are creating a new type of taxi that can serve people on the wheelchair. So. Previous to their emergence in the Hong Kong market, you don't really hear much about this type of taxi in Hong Kong. There are illegal vans and things like that, and some buses provided by NGOs, but not in this format that is uh, providing a high quality service and uh, you know very specially designed taxi. So how they are actually benefiting the benefiting the public or creating a new interest for the for the public is they have been because of their models they have. Uh, initiated some change in how the government see what it can do in terms of providing taxi services with, for example, the new government, the government is asking uh, at least 10% or 30 wheelchair accessible taxi for any new taxi company to operate in Hong Kong. And also they can set their own price, et cetera, et cetera. So, so next, yeah. So, so from SE prototype with this type of taxi, they gain policy attention, not just by investors, impact investors, and also there's a guy there very important in the legislative council in the photo. And also they also influence SMRT, which is the MR, uh, subway in Singapore to build a collaboration, right? And then uh, the social enterprise is causing some policy adjustment in the Hong Kong's government in terms of providing a new regulations in terms of how much the percentage of the wheelchair as accessible Taxis needs to be there, and also it has uh, gained uh, endorsement by some, uh, you know, some senior government officials, and their quality service workflow has been incorporated the government policy. So, so this is another case in Hong Kong. Next, yeah. So this is the last case that I also have been working with for over ten years, uh, the poor bistec, which means a beef steak kitchen. So what this as is doing is trying to work together with the former, uh, uh, you know. Uh, religious extremists slash uh, terrorists, depending on how you look at it. So they're trying to reintegrate these people into the in the community, 
Uh, but there's a lot of limitations in what the government can do in dealing with this type of uh, you know, militants or combatants. Uh, the, the, the innovation of the model, which is recruiting these people and training them to be chef, to be operator and manager of the restaurant, selling this type of beefs, beef steaks, you know, they gain this recognition. And, and uh, for example, the, the Indonesian Anti-Terrorism Unit and Special Force have been asking their help this social enterprise help to work with them in de-radicalization work, including the United Nations Drugs and Crime. And they're providing a very innovative ways to deal with extremism with emphasis on soft approaches, which is inspired by, by the model of the social enterprise. Next. Next. Yes. So if you look at it, it started with a social enterprise that providing this type of model in the restaurant, food for peace as a model, to gaining policy attention in which the, the founder is trying to promote a lot of what, what they do and gain policy attention to advocacy about what they do to change how the government think about what is meant by de-radicalization, how we can bring in new or non-traditional approaches and partners and focus on integration rather than using militaristic approach or law to deal with terrorists and, and militants to becoming a policy mix in the Indonesian anti-terrorism and special force unit, including they have a smart farm to, to work together with the former terrorists. Next. So what we can see here um, from policy, from as a prototype to gaining policy attention to policy experimentation and policy mix, Light B has reached to the end there, becoming a policy mix of the government, including the probistic. And the diamond cap is slightly going to that side, but maybe they're slightly before that, they're still at a, you know, changing the government, government is, the government is still experimenting with these new ways of dealing with the taxi, but a lot of social enterprises just stop there, being a prototype, not growing really big in scale or influence, and some social enterprises have created policy attention, for example, with what they do in terms of dealing with dis disabled issues or gender issues or whatever. Next. And uh, tackling the social versus the public question, this is where I think... Um, uh, some of the uh, literature from public administration could play a role because in the social entrepreneurship literature, which is mainly from the business literature, that the talk about social entrepreneurship as a hybrid organization. The, the root of this is in the business discipline, in the business ideology. Uh, there's a lot of de debate about what is social. Is it ethical? Is it moral? Is it societal? But a lot of the term that people use when we talk about social entrepreneurship or social enterprise, social means beneficiary. There's a certain groups of people, a niche group of people who benefit from the social enterprise activity. I'm here to propose a new proposal. Why don't we look at the public instead of the social? We're looking at organizations that create public interests, public benefits, and perhaps we can also talk about public value creation instead of just that social value creation. And this is where we can bring in a lot of literature from the strategic management of public organizations, from public, the uh, public administration theories called public value into the uh, discourse and theory about social entrepreneurship. Next. So this is near the end of my talk, uh, in which I'm, I'm trying to say that there's a lot of organizations that act in the public interest, you know, many social enterprises, corporate ventures, NGOs, civil society. Uh, some gain policy attention, some inspire the governments about this new model that social enterprises provide. And some of them have been included in policy planning, uh, like the, the, the taxi that I mentioned. And also some of them has been able to change how the government's policy and become a policy mix, a part of policy mix and creating the public benefits. So in, in the context of this public value theory, you start from uh, activities that benefit, uh, with the public interest in mind to experimenting with public value, to co-opting public value, which means that the public value is being adopted by the public sector, but the government, for example. And this leading to some outcomes. And you can see that actually, as you go to the further to the right, fewer and fewer of these social enterprises can achieve this because you need to be really um, offering something really new or something really effective that would convince the government that these solutions that social and social enterprises provide could could actually solve a lot of these issues, or unemployment or disability or you know poverty or health or climate change. And, and you can see smaller and smaller number will, will get there, but many of them will work in the interest. So I was, I'm proposing a new concept that I call public interest enterprise instead of a social enterprise. And 
this can encompass a broader form of organization, including B Corp, for example. There's a lot of talk about benefit B Corporation, a, a, a certification for for-profit companies that are creating a lot of benefits, for example. This, 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 if they only look at it as a B Corp, it's too narrow, it's too small, and it doesn't create a lot of inspiration for people to study these, to, 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 to advocate, but B Corp could be a part of this. A lot of NGOs, a lot of uh, for-profit companies that are doing something in the interest of the public, as simple as a football club. You know, if you have a very famous footballer in the World Cup or major major sports tournament shows how you can be environmentally friendly or uh, deal with some issues, they will change a lot of the public. This create public benefits. So I've been talking about some of the issues with social entrepreneurship. And then I'm, I'm asking, can social enterprise dance with the government? Uh, in our work as, as scholars, as academics, we, also, we are often asked, what is your policy impact? What is the impact of your work for the policymakers? We could also ask the same questions of social enterprise. What is your impact for the policy for the government? So, so in this talk, I'm proposing a shift from the discourse about social to public, which is public value creation. And I'm proposing a concept of public benefit enterprise or public interest enterprise, whichever we like it. But the idea is this enterprise create benefits, value to the public in certain ways, uh, and gain trust, gain legitimacy from the public about what they do. They can be more efficient. They can be uh, providing a better uh, service to the public. That's all from me. Happy to take some questions uh, and I'll stop it here. Thank you. Bye-bye.